I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Uh, Mario Co um, Cosa is representing Community Matters, and Mario has worked with children and adolescents as a, a teacher, theater arts instructor, and psychodrama dramatist, uh, drama therapist for nearly four decades. He specializes in work with all adolescent groups and trauma survivors and is certified by the American Board of Examiners in Psychodrama Drama, and by the National Association for Drama Therapy. He travels globally offering trainings in the US, Canada, the UK, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. Mario is recognized by his peers as a leader in the field of adolescent development, education, and therapy. He has conducted workshops around the world on utilizing action methods with adolescent groups and is a trainer in a number of other science-based prevention curricula. Uh, Mario, we're so excited that you can be here today. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And without further ado, ado I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Luis. So um, I have to share with you my definition of the word expert. If I'm coming here as an expert, you need to know what that means. So the, the best definition I've ever heard of expert is someone who knows something about something and lives at least 100 miles away. And given that I live in Bali, Indonesia, I must be a very big expert. But uh, all joking aside, the real experts here are those of you who are participating in this workshop, both parents and uh, school staff. You're the ones who know your students. You're the ones who know your community. You're the ones who know what the impact of the last almost two years of this pandemic has been on your families, on your community, on your school. So the information that I'm going to share with you uh, hopefully you'll be able to use it to enhance the strategies that you use in good communication with, with your young people in dealing with the various issues you're going to be looking at tonight. I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen with you. Pfizer has asked for similar emergency authorization, which is expected to come as early. Okay, so to, uh, my presentation is about bullying intervention and communication skills and knowledge and tools for parents. In the one hour, a little bit less than one hour that I have, I'm going to be able to give you a taste, some good information, a few strategies, but it's rather like going to a, a fast food place rather than going to a fine restaurant. And I encourage you, if the things that I cover and the other presenters cover really get you interested in knowing more, to let the school district know and uh, more in-depth training type workshops can be provided. All right, so every few years, new jargon, new language comes up to describe educational uh, matters. And, the, the idea of school climate is one that's been around for a while. So I guess it's pretty good. School climate is a way of looking at uh, the overall atmosphere that young people are involved in in their education. And we know that school climate is contributed to by the organization, by the school district, by the staff of the school, by the students, by the families, and by the community. So the first thing I want to really encourage you, if you're going to be an active, supportive parent, family member, or school staff member, is recognizing your place in uh, the school climate community and, and knowing that the more families communicate with the school, the more communities communicate with the school and the school district, the better off students will be. The things that we're going to be looking at tonight, we're going to look at the problem and costs of mistreatment, 
And notice I'm saying mistreatment rather than bullying. I'll talk more about that in a minute and the impact on school climate. And I'm going to offer you some skills for effective communication with children. Uh, unfortunately, we won't have a lot of time for practicing them, but I'll demonstrate some of them for you and offer some strategies for learning to be an effective advocate for creating safer schools. Now, a hundred years ago when I was in school, bullying, we thought of bully as the guy who beat you up and took your lunch money. Nowadays, we've got classical definitions of bullying, the unwanted aggressive behavior among school-age children that involves a real or perceived power imbalance. The behavior is repeated or has the potential to be repeated over time. And both kids who are bullied and who bully others may have serious lasting problems. Unfortunately, this definition makes some students as well as some parents and teachers miss some of the behaviors that have the same impact that this type of, of behavior that's defined as bullying costs, uh, causes. So that's why in uh, community matters, we use the word mistreatment instead of bullying. And mistreatment can be something as simple as exclusion. Uh, the target of mistreatment feels left out. The student who doesn't get picked for uh, to be on a team or doesn't get picked to be in a, a work project. Put downs, the kinds of things that happen, you know, that seem like, oh yeah, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Well, the thing we know now is that that's not true, that this kind of uh, emotional abuse, put downs, can also have a, a serious impact on young people. Intimidation is closest probably to the traditional definition of bullying, anything that makes the target feel afraid. And unwanted physical contact is the other piece of that that makes the target feel violated. One of the things to keep in mind though, when we think of unwanted physical contact, it doesn't have to hurt someone just kind of bumping into you or flicking your shoulder or doing something that uh, invades your personal space can over time can have a serious impact just as well as the kinds of behavior that cause bruises or black eyes. And, and also another type of mistreatment that we often don't think about uh, is what we call acts against campus, things that affect everyone, vandalism, things of destroying of uh, school property, things that make, as students spend time in the school environment, that makes them feel that this is not a safe place to be because of the, the way things happen. So we want you to be uh, aware of using language of mistreatment, not just bullying when talking to uh, your children. Some of the things that we know now, especially you see here this picture of the uh, mobile phone, because of technology, bullying and other forms of mistreatment are occurring at younger ages. Even in elementary school, there, when I've done presentations, uh, I work with a program called Safe School Ambassadors, even working in elementary schools with first, second, third, fourth, fifth graders, uh, we hear reports of the different kinds of mistreatment. It's also getting meaner, again, because of some of the effects of social media, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. It's becoming more acceptable in youth culture. And this is one of the big things that we need to challenge, that it's not cool to be cruel, that it's not okay to be mean to people, that what's really 
the acceptable way of behaving is behaving in a civil and kind manner to each other. And we have, uh, you know, certainly the media that we are all exposed to and that our young people are exposed to presents a very different picture of what acceptable behavior is. So that's another challenge for educators and for parents to really communicate with our young people about what is, uh, what might be true in the movies or what might be true on television, but what do we really want to have be true in our families and our, and our schools? The last piece here on this slide is that uh, mistreatment is much harder to identify because of the fact that students are becoming experts in electronic aggression. And it's very hard to know. When I was in school, uh, if someone was gonna be mean to you, they did it to your face or they sent you a note or they wrote things in, in what we used to call slam books where people would uh, write things about their classmates. Now somebody can post something online and the entire school can see it. So there's a, a much different dynamic, especially for, for those educators and those parents who come from uh, generations before the advent of everybody has a mobile phone. I know some of you parents are, are much younger than I am, so you are more accustomed to that kind of technology. <clears throat> Some uh, statistics that are important to know, nine out of 10 elementary school students report having been bullied or mistreated by their peers. And six out of 10 have reported bullying or mistreating others. That's 90% in elementary school have felt mistreated and 60% have mistreated others. A third of students in grades six through 10 nationwide have experienced some kind of bullying or mistreatment. So we know that this is not just a local problem. And also I have to tell you, uh, I live in Bali, I've worked internationally. This is an international problem. Schools in Japan, schools in Indonesia, schools in China are experiencing the same kinds of things in terms of mistreatment and electronic mistreatment that your children are experiencing in Sacramento. Particularly in terms of cyberbullying, 20% of youth have reported cyberbullying others. That is mistreating others through the use of cell phones and social media. The targets, 16% of the young people who've been mistreated are children ages six to 11, and 33% are teens. Another really frightening statistic is that victims of cyberbullying, the targets of cyberbullying, are nearly twice as likely as non-victims, as non-targets, to attempt suicide. So going back to what I said a little while ago about that old uh, saying, sticks and stones can break my bones, we know that it's not true. That children who are mistreated can uh, suffer various consequences and long-term consequences. There's research now that shows that adults who have been mistreated as children are more likely to have um, stress-related illnesses, to have heart attack at a younger age, to have high blood pressure, to be less able to engage in meaningful relationship, to be less able to manage money effectively. So we're not just talking about, wouldn't it be nice if everybody was nice to one another, but we're talking about behaviors that have both a direct and a long-term impact on the young people that we care about. Some of the personal costs to young people, illness, absenteeism, uh, across the United States, the statistic is about 160,000 young people stay home from school 
every single day because they're afraid of how they're going to be treated. So think about that number. It's a huge number, 160,000 students across the country. And think about the young people that you are parents or that you are educators for. And you know, have your children, have your students ever missed school saying that they were sick, but you wonder, I wonder if they really are. You're going to be um, introduced to some people who are going to be sharing information about drug, alcohol, tobacco, and vaping uh, use following my presentation. That's another personal cost of mistreatment. Depression, eating disorders, self-mutilation, suicide are some of the personal costs to young people who are being mistreated. And sometimes we don't notice these things until they're pretty well developed. So it's important to really uh, start noticing. We'll talk in a minute about some of the indicators that we might want to be aware of. There are also costs to learning, what we call the institutional costs. Students can't focus and learn. What we know about the adolescent brain is that the part of the brain that determines whether I'm feeling safe or unsafe, it's called the amygdala for those of you who like words. If the amygdala is triggered and the, uh, the student is feeling unsafe, the part of the brain called the hippocampus that takes short-term memory and puts it into long-term memory so I can remember the information that the teacher is giving me for the test I'm gonna have next week, shuts down completely. So if students are afraid, the information is not going from the present moment into long-term memory where it can be re retrieved. Also the amount of time spent on discipline instead of on education and social learning. The impact on teachers and staff when students are mistreating each other and mistreating not only their peers, but also mistreating the school staff. People are afraid and tense. And sometimes we know all, all too sadly that students bring weapons to school because they're afraid and they feel that might be the only way they can defend themselves. So a few relationship skills to think about, and I'm going to uh, pause the sharing for a moment so I can talk to you about the first two, greet, not grill, and ask, ask, tell. And then we'll come back to the, the sharing. So, Relationship is really, really important. And being able to talk with the young people who are our children or our students is really important. The idea of greet, not grill, is making sure that we approach students with an attitude when they come home from school or when we return from work that feels welcoming and engaging. So we don't start off with, what did you do in school today? Did you have any tests? Did you get your homework done? It's like, you know, hi, how are you doing? And, and the ask, ask, tell is another piece of that idea of greet, not grill. It's not just looking for information, but sharing information. So instead of saying, what did you do in school today? Is everything okay? I might come home and I, uh, you know, if I'm coming home from work, so many parents work, um, you don't get, come home after their students. I might say to my kid, wow, it was an intense day at work for me today. What was, what was school like for you? Was it a hard day, an easy day? Uh, and, and to be able to share information. Also, when we talk a little bit more about open-ended questions, to be able to say, you know, when I was in school, um, people used to make fun of me because of the, the way I dress. I didn't dress the way a lot of other people did. Did that ever happen? You know, does that ever happen to you? So it's not just about asking for information, 
but sharing information. One of the things that we know developmentally is that adolescents are great at shutting down uh, the barriers, uh, of putting up barriers to communication and appearing that they're not listening and not interested. But what I want to say to you parents of adolescents is it's not really true. They're listening. They're listening and it matters the way you speak to them. You won't. Unfortunately, someone once said, you know, small children are like puppies. Adolescents are like cats. And cats come to you on their own terms, not on your terms. But it still matters that we treat our adolescent students in a way that shows we care. I remember working with a group uh, some years ago where one of the group members was complaining that her mother was always asking her, well, where are you going? And who will you be with? And will their parents be there? And she was saying, God, I'm 15 years old. My mother treats me like a baby. And one of the other girls in the group turned to her and said, Heather, what is it like to have a mother who cares about you? My mother never asks me those things. And it totally changed the dynamic of the group for someone to be able to recognize that when we don't ask those questions, even if our young people get annoyed with them, uh, uh, the students feel absolutely neglected and uncared for. So, you know, it may be difficult. Adolescents um, are a challenging group to work with, but they are paying attention in ways that younger children haven't learned to do yet. So this whole idea of open-ended questions, some of you may be aware of this, open-ended questions are questions that can't be answered with yes or no, or yeah, I don't know. So here are some examples. When kids are mean to each other, how does that affect you? How does it make you feel? And this would be a great opportunity for that tell part of ask, ask, tell. I know when I was in school, when I saw people being mean to each other, it made me kind of be real quiet because I didn't want them to be mean to me. Has that ever happened to you? Another thing that is a, a huge issue is what it, people are aware of called the TikTok challenge, where students are challenged to do horrible things to teachers, to each other, to the school environment. So to be able to say, when you see a TikTok challenge that asks you to do something negative that will hurt something, how does it make you feel? And to be able to say, you know, why this kind of thing upsets me as a parent or as a teacher. There's a really excellent video interview with a, a man who talks about the way social media sites, the algorithms, I, I still don't really understand that word, but it makes me feel important to use it. The algorithms that they use to determine when you turn on Facebook or when you turn on any of your social media or even YouTube, what are the offers that they make to you? It has to do with what you've clicked on before. And this um, short video, that the school that the district is going to provide you the link to, it's worth watching, even if the, the interviewer is a, a guy named Trevor Howard, who some people love and some people hate. But wh whatever you feel about Trevor, listen to the person he is interviewing, because it really is uh, informative about the way the algorithms work at identifying the things that get most clicked on, which tend to be the most dramatic, and then the most offers are made that way. So one of the strategies we need to look at for ourselves personally and to work with our young people is to really think before you click on something on social media. You know, is this something I is going to give me information that I really need? versus is this going to set me up to get a lot of other stuff similar to this and make the social media um, 
website or sites, whatever they're called, uh, think that this is what I'm interested in. And I stop getting the information that might be really useful. I mentioned this one too before, what do kids wear at school? So again, asking questions that show your interest and also that share your experience. The other piece that's uh, equally important is called active listening. And that means giving 100% of our attention. That if, when we have the opportunity to speak with our students, we can't have, uh, or our children, we can't have a phone in our hand, we can't uh, have a newspaper in our hand, we might be doing something else, you know, it might be that we're making dinner or setting the table, uh, and, and that's fine. One of the things that I've discovered about students is that often, as adults, we've been taught that eye contact is a way of showing respect. And so when I'm talking to someone, I generally look at them. And I want to invite each of us to reflect on if we've ever said to uh, one of our students or one of our children, look at me when I'm talking to you. Seems like a natural thing to do. But for many young people, especially adolescents, making eye contact makes the communication more difficult. So be open to the possibility that I can make an open invitation to talk and that the young person may respond in a way that's different from the way I would expect, but they can still be listening. I also, a really important uh, strategy is this paraphrasing and reflecting to say, wait a minute now, all right, so you just said something and I really wanna make sure I understand this. So let me say what I think I heard you say and you tell me if I've got it right. And then paraphrase, reflect back to them. And then they get to say, yeah, 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 you got it. Or that's not quite it. I also wonder how many of us have ever had a student or a child say, you just don't understand. And I want to suggest to all of you who are listening that the best response to that is, you're right. There's no way I can possibly understand what's going on for you because the, the world that we live in right now, the situation that we've been enduring for the last two years with the COVID pandemic is something that I never experienced when I was a teenager. So I don't understand, but I want to. I want to understand. So help me. Help me to understand what's going on for you. And let me share with you you know, what my experience was, and we can see what parts of it we've got in common and what parts of it are different. You know, um, parents don't come with an instruction manual, you know, and, and, and maybe you're my instruction manual. You can help me do, uh, learn the best way to be a good parent to you. Also, identifying and naming feelings, um, particularly for, you know, we assume that uh, it's pretty easy to tell the difference between anger and sadness. But for young children, even for adolescents, understanding and being able to name feelings is a growing skill. So it's important to say, well, you know, I'm not sure what I'm hearing. I, I, are you saying you feel angry or are you upset or are you sad? help me understand the feeling and to give them that opportunity. Also know, know that um, a three minute good conversation is better than a 15 minute battle. And if you start with uh, small goals of having that three minute good open ended active listening kind of conversation, with your student, then gradually it may build to a five minute, to a 15 minute conversation. But 
be be ready to let go of it when it's not when it's when it feels you know be be sensitive to when it's time to end also the kind of language going back to what i said before about the importance of understanding the difference between mistreatment and uh, bullying in the traditional sense it's important to use language that um, reflects behavior rather than puts labels on people. So instead of talking about bullying, the language we suggest is to use the word target rather than victim. A victim is a label. A target is anyone who gets hurt. And we've all been targets. We've all been hurt. So we can we can say, you know, let's, you know, have you ever been a target of somebody else's anger or somebody else's meanness? The aggressor is someone who hurts others. And the fact of the matter is that we've probably all been aggressors as well. So if we focus on the behavior rather than the label, then I'm more able to see that someone who I consider my friend was maybe an aggressor toward me today and said something mean or hurtful because I, you know, they're not a bully, they're my best friend. But in this particular moment, they did mistreat me. And also to understand that 85% of the school population tends to fall into the passive majority, into bystanders, the ones who watch and do nothing because they're afraid of becoming targets or because they think it's funny or because they're pulling out their phones to record it. So again, uh, and uh, the, I believe that, uh, Luis, I believe that these uh, PowerPoint slides are going to be available to people both in English and in Spanish as well. So yes, he's nodding. So you don't have to try to remember everything that I'm saying to you. You'll have this information as a reference. And again, just to remember all of these types of mistreatment, being excluded, being put down, and things that are affecting the campus have just as big an effect on our students, on our children as things that make them feel afraid or violated, the intimidation and the physical mistreatment. So here's some, that again, I mentioned before, sometimes it's hard to tell, uh, and sometimes it's hard to tell until it's too late. So some warning signs that children are being excluded, mistreatment, bullied, harassed, or worried frequent physical cuts or injuries that the, uh, your child may say, oh yeah, I fell on the playground. Uh, and all kids do. Kids fall on the playground. Uh, the adults have injuries too. But the frequency is an indication. If your child is, seems afraid to go to school or reluctant to go to school or missing a lot of school, because of illnesses, and then later in the day, they're miraculously feeling better. Uh, that's, that can be an indication. If they've lost interest in sports or games or school in general, uh, if they appear nervous, if they have trouble sleeping, anxious or irritating, or if they begin mistreating younger siblings, now, so, uh, a thing, uh, kind of a, a warning I have to say about this slide is that when young people move from that transition of preteen into adolescence, when puberty hits, some of these things are going to be part of the transition from childhood into adolescence. Interests are going to change. Uh, anxiety is going to be different, sleep patterns are going to change, and behaviors are going to change. So look for consistency over time and be aware of, of what, what age and what developmental stage your student is at so you can respond appropriately. So again, the most important thing building relationships, 
trying to see the world through the eyes of your young person. And, you know, depending upon our own age, things have changed so quickly in the last 20 years, in the last 10 years, in the last five years, in the last two years, that our ability to really understand the experience of our children, whether they be our students or our, our, our children that uh, we are parents to, has really been compromised. Uh, we all can reflect on the impact that the COVID pandemic has had on us, but the type of impact that it's had on young people is multiplied by two, by five, by 10. I've been uh, here in Bali, I'm often approached by parents, uh, expat families who live in Bali to work with their, their young people who seem to be exhibiting anxiety or depression or panic. And one of the first things I say to these young people is what you're going through right now is an absolutely normal reaction to an abnormal situation. What has happened since this pandemic has turned the world on its head. What has been going on socially and politically across the whole planet, you know, not just in the United States, but in other countries as well. There is so much political and social unrest that students who do not feel a bit anxious, who do not feel a bit concerned, are to me a greater concern. If they feel like everything's cool, everything's fine, then they're probably uh, just either not paying attention or just really suppressing what they're really feeling. And so again, being able to say, wow, you know, this last 18, 20 months has been really hard for me. What's it been like for you? Uh, that's an, that's a, a good conversation starter. If mistreatment happens, be willing to address it. And also look at making mistreatment against family norms. The same thing is true with social media. I've had families I've worked with here in Bali where the parents are concerned that their teenagers spend too much time on their hand phones or in front of their computer screens and the kids say I don't spend any more time on my devices than you do. So it's time now as adults that we need to look at uh, how we role model the kinds of behaviors that we want our young people to to feel and especially because of the need for using virtual learning in the last few years with uh, uh, schools being closed for large periods of time and the amount of time that people uh, have no choice but to spend online, even adults working from home, that we need to have that conversation about, it's not just, I think it's a bad idea, but there's research that shows that the amount of time you spend in front of a computer screen, in front of um, a, a phone screen, affects your sleeping affects your eating, affects your, uh, the way you feel during the day. So we need to balance that. And if we have to increase our screen time because of our education, because of our work, then we need to consider how we can move away from our screens during other times. You know, play board games, go for walks, walk, work in the garden, uh, play with our pets. And, and these, these are things that are important pieces of the conversation. And once again, to not just to tell our young people what they should be doing, but by talking together about the strategies that we can use as families, that we can use as school communities to deal with the challenges of the 2020, 2021, and what's coming in 2022. These are very different times. Uh, we want to teach children to be aware and confident 
to target refusal skills, and I know that you'll be getting more of that in some of the following presenters. The importance and the power of words, and this is very important, when and how to get help from adults. That there is kind of a social norm that it's not okay to talk to a teacher. It's not okay to talk to your parents. And one of the things we know is that something that builds resilience in young people is having adults in their life other than their family members whom they feel trust in. So let them know, you know, there may be some things you're not ready to talk to me about, but is there a teacher at school? Is there a counselor at school? Is there a parent of a friend of yours that you feel comfortable? Because there are some things that, um, you know, your friends don't have enough information to really support you. So no, it's okay to talk to adults when you have issues that are going on for you. Encourage your child to share school experiences. Again, the open-ended questions, greet, not grill, ask, ask, tell. And empower your child to resolve differences, to look at the way differences are resolved in your home, in your classroom, and think about, is there something we could be doing differently when we have differences of opinion that will help us to, to develop the skills that we need to engage uh, in productive ways. Communication skills, again, small doses, a few minutes of good communication will build. And again, three adults, at least one good friend. And be aware of the fact that uh, for any student, but especially for adolescent students, that peers provide a kind of support that adults can't. And conversely, adults provide a kind of support that peers can't. So make sure that your, your children have both peer support as well as adult support. And communicate with the teachers and counselors. Uh, I'm really delighted at the way that the district is taking interest and as difficult as it is to spend as much time as we do in front of computer screens, do, having these kinds of opportunities for parents and families to talk and to communicate and get information virtually where we don't have to worry about childcare, where we don't have to worry about transportation uh, are a real plus. So, you know, pats on the back to the school district for really following through on providing these opportunities. So I really want to encourage those of you who are attending to talk to other parents who didn't attend and say, you know, I got some good information out of that last meeting. There's another one coming up. Maybe you'd like to go too, because it's important that we get the information that we need to be able to be responsible parents, responsible educators. Learn about the issues, read, collect information. One of the good things about YouTube, that's also a bad thing, if we look at only videos about horrible things, then every time we turn on YouTube, we get horrible videos. But if we start watching videos about uh, communication skills, about how to talk with young people about tobacco, alcohol, and other drugs, then when we turn on our YouTube page, that's the, those are the invitations we start getting. So the more time we spend, uh, and the same is true for other websites that we uh, use to get information from, the more time we spend gaining the kind of positive information, the more likely we are to be offered things that will help us. Learn about technology, promote good practices, safe and civil electronic communication, and participate. These things are also important. I just want to wrap up with a little bit more information, and then I want to have an opportunity for some questions and comments. So cyberbullying, huge issue, although I prefer to call it cyber mistreatment, 
because again, not everything that is uh, hurtful and has an effect falls into the category that our young people might identify as bullying. But to really look at our own communication skills, the amount of time we spend and how we use technology to build trusting relationships with your children, with your students, to perhaps keep uh, the computer that your children use in a family space so it doesn't become something that's behind closed doors, to monitor your own use of the device, and to really learn the platforms that children use. Uh, when I talk to young people and mention Facebook, they laugh at me. You know, kids don't use Facebook anymore. They don't even use Instagram anymore. They tell me TikTok. I had never even heard of TikTok until about six months ago. But now I know uh, how popular that is with young people and also how uh, threatening it can be because of the TikTok challenges that we mentioned. And it's important to be able to talk about those because we can't, you know, if, if our young people have phones, even the best that we can monitor them. Um, in my experience, young people are much more tech savvy than uh, parents and teachers are. And they find a way around the, the limitations that we may put on electronics. So it's not just about using blocks, but it's also about developing the relationship and communication that allows us to talk with young people. And here's some good websites that will be available to you uh, to get more information about uh, bullying and cyberbullying. Also to recognize just as I mentioned before, that young people need adults other than family members. Think about how you can be an important adult to one of your children's friends and to network with other parents, to talk with other parents about what they're noticing, to be a volunteer, be a caring adult that other students, other young people can turn to raise, donate funds, other resources for programs that teach leadership skills and uh, that are in addition to academic experiences. Certainly, uh, I don't mean to underplay the importance of the academics, but that's only a piece of what school does for our young people. The social emotional learning that happens in school is a huge piece of what helps young people become uh, self-confident and aware and capable. So not to neglect that. And also, especially as children reach middle school and high school, to make sure they have a place at the table to help shape policies and inform decisions, to get them involved in sharing their perspective on what's happening. And we'll, I, I guarantee you'll find some things you never thought of. Also, there's a, a final slide here. Uh, if you're interested more in the whole idea of how to deal with mistreatment, Community Matters, which is the organization I work with during the program called Safe School Ambassadors, and Leanne Lichnowski, who was part of one of the earlier presentations today, are resources that that you can use and you'll have the access to them as well. Okay, so uh, I promised that I would get through, I promised Luis that I would get through this presentation within the hour. And I see that I still have six minutes remaining. So I want to have an opportunity if there are questions and Luis is probably good to unspotlight me and have everybody go back to gallery view so that we can see who else might have a question or a comment. Yeah, absolutely, Mario. Thank you so much for your thoughtful presentation. Lots of great information. If um, we do have time for a few questions, if anyone has any questions, 
feel free to drop them in the chat and we can read them out loud. Or if you are um, comfortable with the Zoom features, you can unmute your microphone. Um, but there are lots of takeaways from your presentation, uh, Mario. I, I think you hit it right on the spot with uh, highlighting some of the um, things that have come out of this period of um, pandemic and being quarantined and, and just things to think about, you know, some of the, the things that may, um, you know, express themselves in behavior challenges or conflicts with other peers. And, and we thank you for your time. Yeah, I think that's really important for parents, for students, for teachers, for school administrators to normalize the fact that the craziness that's going around has an impact and that we all respond to it in ways that are not typical of who we are or who we are as our best selves. And to rather than shame or blame ourselves, to give ourselves permission to talk about it, to talk about how difficult it's been. Mm -hmm. And to know that the more time that we spend doing that, the more able we are to do the kinds of uh, topic focused education that's also important. You know, the math, the science, the, the language skills, whatever else we, we are uh, providing our young people in school. Yep, absolutely. I do see uh, one comment um, and, and question in our chat uh, from a participant. It says, will you be talking more about refusal skills? Um, I'm assuming, uh, I didn't put a lot of that into this presentation because there were a lot of things that I was asked to cover, but I'm assuming that the uh, subsequent presenters who are going to be working with issues of uh, vaping, tobacco, alcohol, other drugs, will be uh, talking more about that as well. And that yeah. is really important to be able to practice saying no. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, we still have uh, a very exciting lineup of um, a few more uh, presentation topics. Uh, and so we'll be uh, touching on uh, refusal skills and lots of great other information uh, later on this evening. Uh, yes, I see that Sherry uh, is, is going to be talking about refusal skills during her presentation. Perfect. Awesome. So um, we have time for maybe one more question or comment or any takeaways that anyone would like to share. Feel free to drop it in the chat and I can read it to the group or you can um, share it out loud. All right. Well, Mario, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we appreciate you being here to join us and we hope to have you back for another presentation. Um, hopefully we can partner up with you and with the rest of our speakers for our spring uh, lineup of, of family education opportunities. Thank you so much and, and yes. take care. And one of the wonderful things about afternoon evening presentations in California is that it's morning in Bali. So it's a perfect <laughs> time for me to join you. Yes. So I'm, I'm going to go have breakfast now. Thank you all. And <laughs> uh, thank you for providing the opportunity for me to join you. And, and thank you to the district for providing this opportunity for parents. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mario. Um, so for those that have just joined us, uh, we welcome you to tonight's Family uh, Prevention Strategies Workshop. Um, Mario was our first speaker of a total of four that we have lined up for you today. Uh, lots of uh, exciting information that we'll be sharing. Uh, before we get into our next speaker, we're going to take a brief uh, intermission and go into our first raffle uh, drawing of the evening. So I'm going to hand it off to Virginia from our preventions team, who will uh, lead us in uh, presenting the first raffle prize. All right, guys, welcome. Thank you for being here. Okay, so I have an up-to-date form of who has signed up yet. If you haven't signed up yet, there are more raffles, so make sure you hit the link in the chat and add your information. 
And for this first raffle, let me share my screen. Uh, it's gonna be a warm and cozy kit. So it includes a cable knit blanket and some hot cocoa and some extra goodies. So I'm excited for you guys. Good luck. And let's get the show on the road. Let me see. All right, let's go. Good luck. Jerry, woo! Um, congratulations, we got your info uh, on that on that um, spreadsheet, and we will get that to you. Um, let's see. Let me unshare. And then we'll just take it back to Luis for our next speaker. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Virginia. Um, so we are going to move on on our agenda here. Let me go ahead and share my screen so I can introduce our second speaker of the night. Um, let me get to the correct uh, window here. All right. OK, so. Um, Moving on to our next presentation, I'd like to introduce uh, Robert Hackinson, who is uh, representing Dynamic Influence tonight. And a little bit about the speaker, uh, Robert has been delivering edutaining presentations to youth, parents, and professionals for over a decade. Uh, it has been his mission to deliver very dynamic and engaging presentations because he believes if the audience is bored, they aren't listening to his message. Robert's engaging presentations connect with audiences, deliver helpful and relate, relatable information, and leave a lasting impression that will have people talking. He has presented in 47 states coast to coast, uh, also including Canada and around the world, to students, parents, and for professional development. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Robert, who has prepared a presentation for everyone on vaping and uh, raising awareness about that. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop my sharing my screen here. And Robert, welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. And uh, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for taking the time to be here tonight. I know how hard it is uh, carving out time to, uh, to do these types of things. So tonight, uh, when it comes to vaping, we're going to be kind of looking at, especially as parents looking at trying to help your kids navigate the difficult waters that they're facing, right? When it comes to vaping, you have to think about why, why they're vaping. So that's what we're going to kind of get into first. When you think about it, the type of messages that the uh, that our kids are seeing who's behind them who's behind a, behind the vaping industry it's actually big tobacco big tobacco owns about 97% of the vaping industry that surprises some because they look at it like no big tobacco is vaping their competitors no not anymore back in the day they were um, but really what what happened is a lot of teens weren't vaping you had existing smokers that were switching over to e-cigarettes. And this creates a problem because now, as tobacco executive once said, young adult smokers are the only source of replacement smokers. So if they don't do it, then the industry is going to decline. Tobacco companies start losing money. They don't have anybody new coming into the pipeline. So all of a sudden, they started buying up all the vaping industry making their own vaping products, and then they changed the marketing. So now all of a sudden it wasn't about quitting smoking anymore. Instead, it was more about being fun, being social, because you're gonna look at, whenever you're marketing a product, you're gonna look at the pain points. And as a teenager growing up, as many of us parents know, growing up is an awkward time, trying to figure out who you are. You know, all the little social landmines that are around, it's not easy. I ask parents all the time, hey, you want to go back to middle school, high school, mm -mm. college? Yeah. But no, when it comes to middle school, it's, it's a difficult time. So what they do in the tobacco is they made their product look fun. The biggest culprit of this, 
was actually Juul. You can see that with their marketing campaign that they put on. All it did was focus on all they was focus on being social, being fun. You can see that here. You get vaporized, success, hanging out with friends, being social. Down the bottom, little Ariana Grande wannabe down there. Like you can see who they're targeting. And as a result of this, millions of teens start flocking and using vaping products. And that's when the FDA finally stepped in and is like, hey, we need to, we need to figure something out here but the damage was already done. I mean, back in 2011, 2012, after the e-cigarette and vaping had been around in the US for over uh, about four or five years, the teen vaping rates were almost zero. Teen smoking rates also at the lowest point. And that's when everything changed. Now, millions of teens are doing it. That also, and that what's their perception is that it's something that's social, it's something that's fun, and it's it's safe. It's not as it's not as bad as cigarettes. Well, less harmful is the same thing as harmless. There are still some dangers. And you also have to think about how teens view THC, marijuana. How do they view it, especially with all the legalization that's been going on? They see it as something that's safe. It's not a big deal. They see and they say, oh, well, you know, it's, uh, it's legal. Well, even in the states where it is legal, still not legal for you. Uh, you know, they'll say. Sorry. There we go. Even in the states where it is legal, still not legal for you. And they say, well, doctor prescribe it. It must be good for you. Doctors typically don't prescribe it for teens. Only in rare cases would that ever actually happen. They say, well, it's natural, it grows in the earth. So does poison ivy. Don't smoke that either. There's no harmful consequences. And again, this is what they see. This is what they think. There's no harmful consequences because that's what they've been told. They hear that from their friends, even though we understand that's not the case, especially when it comes to the high potency THC that's out there now. When taking that high potency THC on developing brain, things can go wrong. All right, so we understand who's behind the marketing messages. We understand that they're being, uh, they're targeting teens. Why they're targeting teens? Because they need to get them when they're young. So what can you do as a parent to help prevent your kid from falling into this trap? Well, you have to think about why teens might do it. Even though they understand the dangers, how do we combat all the marketing messages? How do we figure out how to connect with them so that even when they're in tricky situations, they'll still make the right decision. Well, let's think about the tricky decisions and the tricky situations. And as a parent, you can help guide them and prepare them to make healthier choices, give them the right tools for their life toolbox. So when they find themselves in that situation, they know what to do. The first one is peer pressure. Now, when it comes to peer pressure, I often ask teens, I'm like, what is peer pressure? How would you define peer pressure? And that's usually when a teen will sit there and tell me, oh, it's, that's when your friends force you to do something you don't wanna do. You know, maybe they triple dog dare you, really? So if I had like a, if I had a vape or a jewel, I'd be like, come on, vape. If that happens, get new friends, that's not normal. If you think about it, peer pressure breaks down into three different types. We do have that direct peer pressure that might be maybe being challenged by a childhood friend, right? Come on, we've been friends for this long. I've been doing this, you can do this. And you kind of feel that pressure, that, that bond. Well, in those moments, what can we do? As a parent, you can make sure that you're constantly talking to your child about making the healthy decisions, making healthy choices. What we can do is, if you think about it, I always ask teens, okay, what do you want? Big picture in your life, thinking about it and actually writing it down, like big picture goals. Um, when you get older, do you want to be healthy? Yeah, I've yet to meet anybody that's like, nah, when I get older, I'd like to be sick. Of course you want to be healthy. All right, uh, when you get older, would you like to have money? Yeah, money would be good. Okay, perfect. Are the decisions that you're making now leading you there? 
That's the question. When it comes to money, did you know that the average smoker, the average smoker spends or wastes between two to four million dollars within a lifetime? That's a lot of money. That's crazy. But when you add up all the different things, it adds up to a lot of money. All right, when it comes to being healthy, if you're getting hooked on something like this now, is that going to lead you there? So when you start having them think about their future and writing it down and reverse engineer what type of decisions that you need to make in order to get there, that's going to be an important piece to help them guide them to making the smart decision. And even preparing them, what happens if one of your friends does this? What happens if maybe you uh, show up to a party? Because that's the other type of peer pressure, the surprise peer pressure, right? Maybe you're going up to show up to, to a party and someone goes, here, you go, crap, now what? You just feel like everybody's looking at me. Everybody cares what I'm about to do right now. No, they don't. They really don't. And if they do, it's definitely not as much as you think, right? But in that moment, when someone hands you something or asks you if you want something and you feel like all the eyes are on you, what are you going to do? Are you going to stop and be like, hmm, what would my mom want me to do right now? No, of course not. You have to be prepared. And that's what, again, you can do as a parent is preparing them for these situations, preparing them, having them think about friends before they go to a party. Hey, no vaping. What could you do? Role play, act some things out. Give them what, some ideas of what to say. Um, just say no. Okay, what else could you do? Not nah, good. I tried it before. I didn't like the way it made me feel. Not nah, good. I don't mess with that stuff. Not nah, good. I got asthma. I don't want. Not nah, good. Mom tests my pee. What? Yeah, they actually have that. They have THC tests as well as nicotine tests. I always encourage parents just to get them, just to have them. You don't even need to use them. But if you just have them, you can even buy them and then show your kid, especially when their kids, when your kids have friends over, you can just walk by, you know, just like, hey, got some tests. And they can be like, oh my God, why would I do that? That's going to be humiliating. Yeah. No, because you want that because that way, if your child is ever at the party, you can, they can be like, no, nah, I got mom test my pee. And they go, yeah, they do. I saw it. That's true. It's real. I always tell them, blame it on your parents. There's different ways, different things that you can do. Being able to stand up for yourself is a difficult thing, especially if you feel lesser than. And that kind of goes into the third peer, the third type of peer pressure, feeling lesser than. I'm feeling down here. You guys are up here. I'm down here. I don't feel confident enough in myself. I don't think I'm cool enough. I'm good enough to fit in. So I need this substance as that crutch to fit in. And that's a deeper problem. And as parents, we need to be able to build them up. Like you have the potential to do some great things. Our kids, they do. They have this untapped potential. And there's nothing worse in life than wasted potential. So being able to build them up, teach them what they can do in these moments, in these really difficult situations, tell them to blame you. You can do, you know, they can do that giving them the out. So that way, no matter what situation they walk into, they know what they're going to do. And again, you can practice role play it. There's a reason why like EMTs and firefighters and military train so much, right? They don't want to get into a high stress situation and make the wrong decision. You don't either. You don't want to be going up to an accident, like lose your leg, be like, oh my God, and EMT shows up. So, uh, you're okay. Just walk it off. Like, No, get back here. Fix my leg. You want them to be prepared not scared. Same thing when it comes to your kids. And if you are able to go through these role playing, go through the scenarios and constantly be in the back of their head, that's your whole goal as a parent is to be the little voice in the back of their head. So when they walk into a situation, it's like, no, 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 no. don't disappoint me. Oh, these are some of the things that we can do. All right. So we have peer pressure and making sure that you're preparing them of what to do, how to say no. And again, I think it's more about focusing on what you want out of your life. Understand your life is built by the decisions that you make. So make them with purpose. Make, build a life that you can be proud of. That's up to you. All right. 
Next, what's the other excuse? Boredom. That's a big one. You ever feel bored? Have your kids ever said, I'm so bored, especially in the pandemic? Yeah. Oh my God, I'm so bored. I told my kids, good, I'm glad you're bored. Yeah, boredom is, it's, it can be a good thing. Helps with creativity, helps with imagination, allows time for self-reflection. It can be good. However, too much time on your hands, all of a sudden, they might start getting into trouble. As a parent, I like to try to make sure the kids are keeping busy, right? And when you have that time, how do you fill it? You can choose to be destructive or productive. I like to focus on that productive thing. What can you do? We live in this age where we have all this information at our fingertips. Find out little things that your kids like. Do they like to game? Did you know there's actually free tutorials online that can teach them how to code and build their own game? That's pretty cool. Online, you can learn a trade. You can learn skills. You can actually build things, make things, and sell them online. Make serious bank. There's a lot of things that you can do. So again, when they're looking at it, trying to fill their time with things that are going to be productive as opposed to destructive. Now, other than boredom, another big one that we have to face, especially in the time of the pandemic, of course, is stress. Feeling stressed. That happens. Even as parents, we know this feeling of stress. And I think the problem that we have as a society right now is how we view stress. We view stress as like, oh my God, you're stressed. Don't be stressed. We teach our kids to try to suppress that stress. Don't be stressed. Don't be stressed. No, you shouldn't be stressed. Here, have a pill. Don't be stressed. Have a drink. Don't be stressed. Have a vape. Don't be stressed. Have some soap. Soap? They have stress-using soap, stress-using lotions, stress-using candles, stress balls. I look at you and say, it's okay to be stressed. And I tell kids too, you're stressed, good. I'm glad you're stressed. Why? Because you're always gonna have stress. Think about it, there's always gonna be stress. Us as parents, we know that. We're all stressed right now. The problem is when we look at it and try to find it as something to suppress or as something to escape from, that's not right. Because there's always gonna be stress. Now is a time to get good at that stress. And that's what we need to be able to teach our kids, especially when it comes to that stress. Stress is always going to be there. I always ask teens when I'm talking to them, I say, who thinks when they finish school, you're going to be less stressed? Who thinks more, right? Maybe you're going to college, less stressed, more stressed, more stressed. You get a job, now you're out on your own, more responsibility. Who's less stressed? Who's more stressed? Yeah, they know this. So if there's always going to be stress, Now's the time to get good at that stress. When I was growing up, I was always taught there's good stress and there's bad stress. There's actually new research that shows stress isn't good or bad, it just is. It's a, your body's natural reaction to help you get through whatever it is that you're dealing with. It's almost like we're coming into the holiday season right now. Anybody have family come over for the holidays? Is that a little bit of a stressful time? I remember just growing up, my mom was just like vacuuming the ceiling. Like, why? Because that's the additional stress, right? It's the fuel that helps you get through all the stuff. You're ramping up to get through it. And that's the whole point. When it comes to our kids, we need to teach them how to cope with that stress. So what do we do? One, we have to view stress differently. When I talk to teens, I usually have them think, the next time you feel stressed, I want you to think lobster. I'll explain. Did you know that a lobster shell doesn't actually grow? It grows within the shell until it gets all uncomfortable. And then it buries itself in the rocks. It sheds all the shells and generates new shells. Then it grows within that shell until it gets too small. It starts stressing out, feeling all uncomfortable. It buries itself in the rocks. It sheds all the shells and generates new shells. The lobster uses that stress as an opportunity to grow. How does it know it's time to grow? Because it feels uncomfortable. It feels stressed. So when it comes to life, like, yeah, if your kid feels stressed, good. Teach them, okay, now, how do you work through that? How do you use that? And that's a great technique. 
they had a study. There was a book. There's a book called The Upside of Stress that goes into a lot of this research on how positive stress can be. And one of the studies in there, it talks about a bunch of teens, and it was right before exams, which can be a very stressful time for some. And they split them up into three groups. They said, you guys over here, if you get stressed, we're going to teach you that stress is a bad thing. You don't want that to happen. If you get stressed, you're going to do bad in the exams. So we have to teach you how to reduce that stress. Okay. We had the control group. They had nothing. Then we have the other group. And they're going to teach you stress is a good thing. It's actually going to ramp you up to help you get through whatever it is that you're dealing with. The results, the grades, the control group, the ones that got nothing, their grades were right in the middle. Those that did the best embraced the stress. Those that did the worst viewed stress as a bad thing. Why? Well, I plant that seed and I say, if you get stressed, you're going to do bad. Well, now we let that idea grow. Then all of a sudden you're there and you're getting your test handed out. You can't stop stress. So all of a sudden you start feeling stressed. Oh my God, I'm getting stressed. I can't stop it. I'm kumbaya. This isn't working. Oh no. And you do bad. You psych yourself out. So we need to be able to teach them, no, it's okay. Stress is good. It's a natural thing. You can use that. If you dwell on it and you worry about it more, now you're creating the anxiety. Now, can stress ever be overwhelming? Yes. So what do you do in those situations? We need to teach healthy coping techniques because sometimes when they get stressed, like, oh my God, I can't do this. I need this substance. I need whatever it is. I need to use this substance to get through this moment. Well, now you're training your brain to use a substance to do that. Even as adults, you know, have you ever had a really stressful day and you're like, oh my God, you come home, you're like, oh, it's such a stressful day and you grab a drink. You're showing them, you're our teens, we have to be aware of this, that we're teaching them when you're stressed, you can use a substance to get through these moments. Instead, maybe we need to teach them healthier coping techniques. Like, oh my God, I'm really stressed. I need to go for a walk. You're going to come for a walk with me. Meditation is another great one. Meditation, being able to, uh, you know, eight minutes a day, that's all it takes. There's a lot of online tutorials on it. There's YouTube videos on it. It's a great way. Eight minutes a day is all it needs. Some people say, I can't meditate. I tried, but my brain doesn't shut down. Nobody's does. If your brain stops, it means you're dead. When it comes to that meditation, it's actually something that you have to practice and stick with. And it does have a lot of benefits. When it comes to exercising, exercising is a great technique to help cope with that stress. I travel for a living. Uh, prior to the pandemic in 2019, I traveled 170 days that year. Actually, too much, way too much. And all of a sudden, May 13th, uh, March 13th, 2020 came and everything shut down. All of 2020, I traveled five days. That was it. And I, Instead, I was home worrying about work and with my three young kids. I worked out every day. I hate working out. I know there's people out there that love working out. I'm not one of them. I hate working out. Before I work out, I look at it, I'm like, I don't want to do this. As I'm working out, I'm just like, I don't want to do this. I just want this to be over. Why do I do it almost every day? Because of the way it makes me feel afterwards. Mentally, I'm better. My wife has anxiety. She actually joins me every morning. We go down and we work out. We both hate it, but we also love our kids and we don't want to kill them. So we need to make sure that we continue to exercise and get mentally right. So teaching our kids the same, I think can be a great thing, giving them the different opportunities, whether it's exercising the body, meditation, exercising the mind, another great one. Now, uh, a few other things when it comes to that meditation, uh, when it comes to the mental health, writing things down, you know, getting it out of you, just writing down your ideas, having a gratitude journal, a gratitude journal every day, every day, write down three things that you're grateful for. And then one thing that you're proud, about, proud of about yourself. And that way, even on those really difficult days, you can still go back to this and flip through and you can see it. As a parent, you can do that too. It helps get through those really challenging and difficult days that we all face. One of the biggest uh, stressors that we have, especially as teens, one of the biggest stressors that they face is failure. When it comes to failure, 
it's like, once again, how we look at it. People look at failure. I can't deal with this. And now I'm going to try to escape to this substance, whether it's vaping or on a different substance. I need to use this as that way of coping. The reality, I think we just have to look at failure differently. You know, Homer Simpson, tried, failed, lesson learned, never tried. Great show, horrible message. The reality is failure is actually just part of the journey to that success. As a society, we often just focus on the successes though, right? Especially social media. All we do is we look at the successes. We don't look at all the other failures. Every successful person has two things in common. One, perseverance and two, resilience. Perseverance is understanding something's gonna take a long time to get. There's gonna be a lot of failures along the way, but it's still worth it in the end. And then resilience is how fast you're able to bounce back from that failure. The only time you really fail is if you stop trying. So I think it's so important, so important right now that we make sure that we teach our kids how to view failure a little differently. We wanna make sure that the next time they feel failure, I want them to be thinking about the rear view mirror. The rear view mirror rules this. If you're driving in a car, how much time do you spend looking up at a rear view mirror? Not that much. What happens? If you look up at it, you're gonna crash. So yeah, you glance up at it, but majority of the time you're focused on what's right in front of you. So all the failures and all your successes should be in the rear view mirror. Yeah, look up, oh, that was awesome. Oh, that, not so much. Majority of the time, focus in front of you. Do we look way far ahead? You can. But again, glancing up and then focusing there, because if all you do is focus on way ahead, then you start worrying about that, and that creates the anxiety. And as much as you worry about something, it's not going to change it. So instead, focus on what's in front of you, and as obstacles come, we work through them. And as a parent, we need to coach our kids how to work through those challenges, how to work through those obstacles, how to work through failure. It's okay if you fail, as long, I should say, it's okay to try and fail. Because that failure is, again, part of that journey of success. Every failure, you're learning something. So it's okay. It's also really challenging because we're constantly comparing ourselves to other people. Mark Twain once said, comparison is the death of joy. That's the truth. Why? Because you know your personal truth. You know everything about you. Your kids know everything about themselves, right? They know what it's like at home. They know what it's like at school. They know what it's like with their friends. They know everything about themselves ourselves. We know everything about ourselves. Do you share that with everybody? No, of course not. We put on what's called a social mask and this is what we show. What often happens with our teens is that they're looking at other people and they look at them like, oh, look at the amazing life that they have. I don't do that. I'm down here. I'm start to feel lesser than. And if you feel lesser than, you're going to start making lesser than decisions. And that's once again, where you're going to look at things like substances vaping or other things as that way of trying to escape, as that way of trying to cope. So what I always like to make sure that we have to teach our kids is if you start comparing yourself to other people, you're comparing your personal truth to their highlight reel, especially with social media, right? We don't post reality, we post perfection. Whenever you start comparing yourself to others, think about an iceberg. If, they ever, if you hear them talking about others and how great they, they have, their life is, I like to think of an iceberg an iceberg floating in the ocean, all you see is the tip of the iceberg. Underneath the water, the majority of it, they're dealing with the same insecurity, same stress, the same stuff as everybody else. You just don't see it because they're not posting it. Now, there's also times in life where you are going to look at other people and be like, that's not fair. Ever felt like that? This isn't fair. Why does this happen to me? Why not them? They deserve it. We have those moments. And this is where I like to teach them about the the poker game of life. The poker game of life is this. In life, like a game of poker, like in a game of life, you have zero control over the hand that you're dealt. There's some people that get better hands, some people that get worse. Now, if you're dealt the worst hand, is it guaranteed you're going to lose? No. Not in a game of poker. Any good poker player will tell you, doesn't matter if you have the worst hand, you could still win. You could have the best hand, you could still lose. It's not about the hand you're dealt, Maz, how you play the hand. 
And especially when things are going wrong, right? Especially when things are going wrong, you feel like you're crashing, like, oh my God, what's going on? Those are the times we need to focus on where you want to go and play your hand to the best that you can. When I was doing my motorcycle safety course, one of the things that they taught is if you're about to crash, you need to look at the exit and stay focused on there. And if you stay focused, you will turn and your bike will take you there. If you keep on staring at what you're about to crash into, you're going to crash. So as parents, we need to teach our kids to stay focused on what they want. Really map out their goals, like what you want in your life, and then reverse engineer to how you're going to get there. And that way, when things are going wrong, you can stay focused. And it's, it's fluid, right? I mean, things change along the way. We have to be able to adapt, and that's part of life too. These are the life skills. It's really about coaching and consulting our kids. Coaching because when they're actually listening and they feel like they're listening. And then there's going to be times where you're going to feel like my kids are not listening anymore. And that's when you have to switch from being a consultant, uh, from a coach to a consultant. And when you're a consultant, here's what you do. You ask questions. Like maybe you search your kids, you know, you're talking to your kids, you're listening Maybe you're smelling some fruit, you see some vaping devices and you find out that they're vaping. Okay, maybe you did one of the tests and you found out that they're vaping. All right, now what? Well, you're, they're gonna say things like, I, I'll quit. I can do it now and I'll quit later. Brilliant. Of course, 90% of smokers start when they were teens. 80% of teens that start using nicotine become long-term users. That's a big statistic because it literally changes the brain chemistry and changes habits. Okay, so that's what they're gonna say. Now you can ask those questions. What questions could you ask? Well, do you think other people smoke? Oh, it's not gonna happen to me. What do you want out of your life? Is this gonna lead you there? Is this being something that's being productive or destructive? They're in charge of building their life. You need to be there as that cook to kind of walk them down uh, the path to figuring it out for themselves. If you ever do find that your child is vaping, there are some resources available for you. Share them here. I can take a screenshot of this. Remember to have communication, always communicating, always talking. You might be thinking, are they even listening? Technically, we only hear about 25% of what's said to us each day. We only remember about 1%. I really wish I knew those stats when I was a kid because that way I could tell my mom, I'm only listening 25%, I'll remember 1%, gotta go. But what it teaches us as parents is we have to say it 100 times in order for that message to actually sink in. You can make that impact. You can make that impact with them. Thoughts become words, words become actions, actions become habits, habits become behavior, behavior becomes character. It all builds on your thoughts. And as a parent, you're able to influence those thoughts. So let's try to steer them to where they need to go. And there was a study that actually showed that when it comes to adults, every teen that ended up doing okay had one stable, caring adult. The fact that you're here taking the time to be here right now shows that you can be that, not only to your kid, but maybe even somebody else's. These are all my sources, so I'm sure you care. And that is all of my information. If anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to reach out afterwards. Uh, thank you guys, everybody, for taking the time to be here. And I hope you got some good things out of it. Thank you so much, Robert. We appreciate you uh, joining us this evening as a guest speaker and really, you know, such an engaging uh, conversation and, you know, engaging presentation on vaping awareness. Um, so we do thank you for your time. Um, certainly in the high school age group, um, vaping is a big 
topic and a big area of concern. So, you know, raising awareness about this is really important and, you know, it empowers parents to be more informed because I too have, um, you know, seen like in, in marketing um, strategies and like in the media, um, many companies try to put, you know, portray vaping as the thing to do or something cool. So I think it's important to acknowledge that. Absolutely. All right. Well, on the same topic of raising awareness about uh, substances, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and introduce the next speaker so that we stay um, on track for tonight's agenda. Uh, let me go ahead and get to that screen. All right, so our next presentation on substance abuse is pres uh, presented tonight by Sherry, and I don't want to butcher your last name. Uh, <laughs> it's Eglund. I know Eglund. it's a weird one. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, Sherry, thank you for being here. Uh, Sherry is Associate Director of Omni Youth Programs, and a little bit about the speaker. Uh, Sherry has been an incredible partner with San Juan Unified School District. Mm -hmm. Her experience includes participating as as an expert speaker at the annual San Juan Unified School District uh, Prevention Programs Youth Action Summit, which is an, a yearly event that the team puts together to raise awareness about substance um, and different prevention topics for students in the district. And Cherie has also been instrumental in providing trainings for our prevention program staff. Um, so we thank you for being here, Cherie, and we're excited about your presentation. Um, thank you everyone that's joining us or have joined us over the course of the night. Um, we're gonna jump right into our next presentation and uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And Cherie, uh, mm -hmm. you're welcome to take All it from right. here. My turn, okay. Yeah. There we go. All right, let me get presentation mode going here. There we go. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. And how long, what time should I be done? Just to check on time here, at least. Just to, oh, you're on mute, hun. Um, thank you for checking. We have yeah. you estimated to end about 7.30ish. Okay, I'll do my best. <laughs> I'm really gonna try, okay. Um, and I'm lucky too, because um, Robert covered a lot of stuff too. That's kind of the same for some of the stuff that I'll be talking about. But yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm going to get right to it. Um, I'm Sherry Aiklin. I'm the Associate Director at Omni Youth Programs. There is my email. Um, I'll be happy to share this PowerPoint. You can get it um, from the, you know, from the organizers here. You can email me directly. Um, if there's any topic that I touch on that you're like, hey, you know, I need, I would like to know more about that or the image that you showed on that one slide, I wanna share that with my teachers or my kids. Just, I will be happy to share absolutely anything on here with you. Uh, so please send me an email. Just to let you know, Omni Youth Programs, we are located here in Sacramento since 1979. Uh, we are one of four prevention agencies in Sacramento County that is funded by the county. And we are a youth drug and alcohol prevention program. And what we do is we go out and uh, not only do we train in some evidence-based model programs, but we do speaking engagements such as this. We used to do them in person, but now we're Zooming, which is nice. <laughs> and we have some different exhibits that we do. Um, and I would encourage you, if you wanna know more about us, check out our website. This is us here. Um, there's also a blog that uh, we have a really good blog writer that talks about um, everything from a t like from a teen's point of view, what's it feel like to be the only one not drinking at a party or how do you behave at a party if you want to have fun but you don't want to partake in any of the alcohol or drugs. Um, our free YouTube channel has a lot of that too. We also have a lot of the handouts and some of the stuff I'm going to be talking about today is on our resources tab. So feel free to check that out and kind of just have some fun clicking around our website. I do want to say thank you to our funders because if anybody here would like a talk about this or anything similar, we do it for free anywhere in Sacramento County, thanks to the Sac County Department of Health Services, Behavioral Health Services, what we call SEPTI, which is Substance Use Prevention and Treatment Services. That's a big mouthful, so we just say SEPTI. Um, but thank you to them because because of them we're able to be here. 
So just to start out, I don't like to dive into the what without thinking about the why. You know, why do I care about what you're talking about, Jerry? <laughs> so why do we want to talk to young people? And I do mean quite young, as young as maybe 10 or 11, about drugs. Why do we want to do that? Isn't that something, you know, early high school, maybe even later, once they get their car or get, get, get a driver's license or start leaving on their own? Well, actually, it is important to talk as early as possible. Um, this is one of kind of the main tenets, one of the reasons that I kind of fell in love with prevention. I didn't set out to be a preventionist. I um, got my master's in marriage and family therapy and was going to be a therapist. And in my internship, Omni kind of snagged me and I never left. <laughs> um, but this is one of the things I love about prevention. We don't tend to think of addiction as a childhood disease, but it actually is if you think about it. What do I mean by that? Well, we think about it as an adult disease because uh, when people are older, that's usually when they're seeking treatment and going into recovery. But did you, did you know that 90% of addictions actually have roots in the teen years? There's tons of studies that talk about this. I'd be happy to send them to you. But a simple way to put it to a young person is to say, if somebody, if me, Sherry, before I turn 21, if I use a substance for the first time, uh, no matter what it is, you know, whether it be tobacco or alcohol, marijuana, um, my chance of becoming addicted later on in life as a grown up are anywhere from like 40 to 80%, depending on a few things like what I'm using, how often I'm using my genetics. Now, me, that same person in my same environment with my same genetics, if I wait instead of before 21, if I use for the first time after 21, my chance of addiction goes down to under 10%. That's a huge difference. So does this mean if you try a cigarette or if you try a joint, you're gonna become addicted? Absolutely not. But it does mean the longer you wait, we call it the age of onset, the longer you wait, the, long, the later the age of onset is, the better chance that you have later on. Um, another way to say it is most studies, so when they go and talk to people that are in recovery, nine out of 10 of them started using their substances, whatever they're in recovery for, started using that substance before they turned 18. Not many people start using after the age of 21 or 25 and end up having to deal with addiction issues later on. So that's why it's so important to talk young. Um, here's some local stats. This is actually from the SEPTI, the Sac County SEPTI uh, Strategic Prevention Plan that just came out. And on the left, this is kind of focused a little bit more on um, Sacramento specifically. Um, and on the right, it's more California total, but you can kind of look at some of these stats here. You can see marijuana especially is huge for the zero to 17 year olds, even way more than alcohol. Those numbers kind of surprise people a lot because they're assuming that alcohol, you know, that's kind of the more accepted drug. Um, but especially for zero to 17 years, 86% um, marijuana is their drug of choice. Uh, and that's of those that use. So that so we're not saying that 86% use, I should have said that, uh, what their drug of choice is, is marijuana. But if you're looking at exactly how many use, if you want to take a look at grade seven, grade nine, grade 11 over here, you notice the huge jump. If you look at grade seven, you're looking at, you know, 6%, 2%, depending on if we're asking about 30 day use, how often, but then it takes a really big jump from seventh grade to 11th grade. This is kind of what we call the prevention sweet spot. And that is definitely that time that you want to get in there and talk to them about some of the things that we've been talking about tonight. Um, and especially using some of the techniques that Mario and Robert talked about earlier. There's a great ways to bring it up. Um, here's another study that showed basically most illicit drug use and what they're talking about in here is marijuana <laughs> because marijuana is not legal everywhere. Um, and they're talking about marijuana, um, that things like that. They're not talking about alcohol and tobacco here, but most illicit drug use starts in those early teen years, that 16 to 14 to 17, you know, all the way to 20, um, is kind of that time. Um, even as young as 12 or 13, I've talked to some kids that are in recovery that said that they had their first drink when they were nine. Um, and it's all age appropriate communication. But when parents ask me, when should I start talking to my kid about drugs and alcohol? I say today, you know, almost no matter how old they are, if you're asking, you should be talking to, to them about it. Um, here's another kind of more recent stat. This was a stat, excuse me, in 2020. 
Um, this is from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and they measured from 2019, it was reported in 220, but uh, in 2019, you're looking at um, past month use for, it, for, for the different age categories. You can see alcohol in blue is still the highest, but marijuana is kind of sneaking up there. Um, and you can see again, look at the huge jump from age 12 to age 17. That's really huge. Um, and if you check over here, this is a different, um, this is a different survey. I'm just kind of trying to show you guys some different, um, different ways of looking at the numbers basically. Um, but past year marijuana use, especially if you look at that huge gap between eighth grade, about only about 12% of eighth graders and all the way up to 36% of 12th graders. So that's kind of the time when you really want to get in there. Um, here's some more stats, just again, a heads up. Uh, I've heard uh, some people say legalization has not made a difference in youth use in marijuana. That is absolutely not true. <laughs> if they're saying that, they're skewing it. Um, legalization definitely from even 2016, which is when we in California legalized, all the way to 2020, youth use has gone up. And I do want to make I do want to make it clear that as an organization, we never speak out against legalization or anything like that. We are just completely focused on youth use. And no matter what it is, youth should not be using and especially marijuana. Um, but again, if you watch what you're looking at it, uh, as in the far right, this is the increase in path month use from 2016 to 2020. So eighth graders from 2016 to 2020 had a 7% increase. But look at 12th grader, I know those 10th graders kind of get lost in the middle there, that's a big number too. But 12th graders from 2016 to 2020, 21% increase. Um, so those numbers you know, are alarming, um, but I do like to point out, especially when I'm talking to young people, if 21% of 12th graders today are using marijuana, what percentage of 12th graders are not using marijuana? Almost 80%, right? That's really high. Um, so if you are someone that think, because usually when you ask teens, they'll say, oh, easily, they'll say anywhere from 50 to 75% of 12th graders are using marijuana. They think the number is much, much higher than it is. Because um, so it's important to point out, actually, if you're not using, you are actually the norm. You're doing what's kind of normal when everybody else is doing. Um, it doesn't seem like it because, again, just like Robert was talking about, if you're doing on Snapchat or something like that, nobody's going to say, you know, hey, what'd you do last weekend? Oh, I hung out and I didn't smoke pot. You know, nobody's going to say that, right? They're not going to highlight that they didn't smoke pot. They're going to highlight if they did, for whatever reason, they like to do that. But so I like to make sure young people understand that most don't. That's important. Um, so why do youth use alcohol and other drugs? Robert talked about this quite a bit. So I'll just touch on it some because a lot of the reasons he said about vaping are true for everything. Um, we've done some listening circles at Omni for local youth. And what I did here is kind of just combine what a lot of different studies and surveys have shown us. Uh, if you ask youth why they're using, they're thinking, hey, I can handle it, right? I'll just use a little bit just to fit in. It'll be okay. I'll just take a sip. I'll take a puff. I'll just do it one time. Uh, boredom is a really, really big reason to be social and do it with friends. And a lot of it that helps me chill. What you're seeing there is a lot of the anxiety that a lot of the young people are dealing with, especially now. Sometimes they're turning to things like alcohol and marijuana to self-medicate. Um, who their role model is plays a really big role. Whoever they kind of look up to, what that person does plays a big role. Uh, so why do some youth not use? Because I like to talk about that too. So that 80%, we asked them, why do you not use marijuana and alcohol? Here's some of the reasons. Um, one of the biggest that kids say is a lot of what Robert was talking about when he said, hey, do you want to be healthy as an adult? Do you want to you know, have money? That was when we asked young people, at, we were a member of the Sacramento County Coalition for Youth, which I would love for you all to join us on one of these times so that everybody's welcome. The young people made this Future Forward campaign. It's starring them and it's by them for local youth from junior high and high schools all across Sacramento. And we asked them, hey, we want to do a campaign to try to limit marijuana use among teens. What should we do? And this is what we came up with. Marijuana is not for me because... I have this, this young man in this ad says that he wanted to be in the military. That was a goal for him. So using marijuana was going to mess that up. 
That was one of the biggest ones. If they have plans for the future, you can help them understand how using would kind of mess that up. That's a really big reason not to. Um, another reason, just like a couple of the other people said, parents are the number one influence. I have a teenager. I know it doesn't seem like it, right? Sometimes hugging a teenager is like hugging a porcupine. It's just the way it is sometimes. Um, but study after study after study, more than friends, more than the media, more than TV or movies, parents are the number one influence on whether or not a young person decides to drink alcohol. Marijuana too. Um, high school students that believe their parents, yeah, they don't think marijuana is that big of a deal, are much more likely to use. And it doesn't have to be a parent, just like the other speaker said, you can be an adult that's that one adult in their neighborhood that they look up to, but they look at the adults in their neighborhood, not just in their house, but they look kind of at the community norms um, and are much more likely to use if other adults in their neighborhood. This is another kind of truism of um, prevention that I really like. If you can increase the perceived risk really of anything, but even if, especially what they're talking about here is marijuana. This is a longitudinal study and they asked 12th graders, how dangerous do you think it is to use marijuana? And do you use marijuana? So if you look at the little ziggy zaggy lines here, the blue is past your use and the kind of stripy candy cane looking one is perceived risk. So in the early seventies, or sorry, mid seventies, you could see perceived risk, basically thinking that marijuana was not dangerous at all, was pretty low, right? And so what happened to use? Really high. Something happened in the early 90s where perceived risk went way up. So past year use went way down. And you can kind of see these numbers bow off each other all the time. So that's why sometimes sharing just little facts and things, letting young people know what risks they're taking, that ultimately, yes, it is their decision. I'm not telling you what to do. You have to be real careful with that. But I am telling you, if you make this choice, here are some things that could happen. You make that choice, here are some things that can happen. Here's what's happened to other people when they make this or that choice. So that when you make that choice, you make it with all of the facts involved. Um, the fear of punishment actually is very, <laughs> very significant too, right? Um, you know, I, I would like to think I drive the speed limit because I care about my, my fellow humans and don't want to endanger anyone. But honestly, the biggest reason is I don't want to get a ticket, right? Young people are the same. Um, and I don't really like the, the word punishment here, but I thought that this um, survey was important. I, a discipline, I think, is more because punishment, you know, I, is, in terms of um, parenting, that's not really a great word to use. But basically, if teens know that there's a consequence to their use, especially a consequence with you, the parent, they're much less likely to use. Um, another thing to take to keep in mind is that another reason it's so important to talk to kids young is because marijuana especially is really addicting our young people. This is all the way from 2011. Um, they, it's kind of hard to get that down, but just talking to people that work in treatment, they say that when somebody between the age of 12 and 17 checks into rehab or rehabilitation or recovery, um, about 80% of the time it's for marijuana. That's not true of adults. Adults do not have the same addiction issues with marijuana that young people do. Uh, we'll talk about why that might be in just a little bit. Um, but just to review, I know some of the other people kind of touched on this, but that remember what, how we said earlier how addiction, like the age of onset is so important? That's because of this. Basically, our brains still develop up until we're about 25, some say even 30. We used to think, hey, when our bodies are done growing, our brains are done, but they're not. What you're looking at here is kind of the development of the brain. The blue and the purple are you know, totally mature parts. The green and the yellow are not mature parts. And if you notice the front part of the brain there, which we call the prefrontal cortex is the very last to develop. Well, what does that prefrontal cortex do? Well, here's some things. Um, considering the future, figuring out what will happen if, um, impulse control, delayed gratification, um, inhibiting inappropriate behavior, trying to do the right thing, weighing possible consequences, uh, modulation of emotions. Now, these are all things that teenagers are really good at, right? No, <laughs> I was not good at any of these things when I was, this is what I totally struggled with when I was a teenager. But it's important for young people to know, if you're struggling with these things, that's what's supposed to be happening. Your brain is still trying to figure this out. Now, is that an excuse? 
Well, it's okay if I'm stupid because Sherry said my prefrontal cortex isn't developed yet. No, <laughs> you don't want to make silly choices. You still want to make, try to train your brain, teach your brain the life that you want to have. But as a parent, it's important to know because sometimes I, I know I'll ask teens, I had teens at a youth program. Um, I, I don't want to be genderist at all, but it was usually the boys did something silly, like jumped a bike off of something or just, I mean, stuff that wouldn't even occur to you. And when you ask a teenager, why did you do that? And they say, I don't know. They really don't know. They didn't really stop and wait. They just kind of went for it. Um, another way I talk about it is a teenage brain is like a Mack truck with bicycle brakes because the part of the brain that wants adventure and trying new things and processes information is really developed. But the part for impulse control is very, very small part of it is developed. So that's why adults like you are so important. Um, here's some quick fix about quick, quick facts about alcohol because I know I have to hurry. Um, <laughs> I, I do talk a lot about marijuana just because that's kind of the newer, you know, sort of threat to our young people. But we do want to point out that alcohol still is the number one substance abused by young people. And in fact, it kills more young people each year than all other drugs combined. I know like other drugs grab the headlines, but alcohol still kills more every year. Um, and a big reason for that is because when young people under the age of 21 drink, they're not having a beer or two. 90% of the time when somebody under the age of 21 is drinking, it's in the form of binge drinking. That's why we tell parents it's not a good idea. The parents will say, well, isn't it safer if I let them party at home or I'm here to watch out for them? Definitely not. Because again, they're not just having a beer or two. And binge drinking has a lot of really bad effects, especially for young people. Um, there are some stats here. And again, I'm not going to go through all of them because I'm running out of time. <laughs> but I can definitely send you this. And I encourage you to look at this because a lot of stuff about drinking and driving, trying other drugs. Um, getting a sexually transmitted infection because they're much less likely to use condoms when they're and they're much more likely to have sex when maybe they wouldn't if they were sober. Um, binge drinking can, it's not just the alcohol, it's the decisions that the alcohol causes. Um, here's another good one. Teens love brain scans. I don't know what it is, but whenever I show young people brain scans, they really get into it. Um, and here, what you're looking at here is two brain scans. Both of these are 15 year olds. The one on the left does not drink alcohol. The one on the right does drink alcohol pretty frequently about every weekend. Now, both of these people were sober at the time of the scans. And what they're doing when the scans are happening is they're doing these like little memory tasks. And they ran these scans to see how active the brains were. And you can probably tell it's pretty obvious. The non-drinking brain, a lot more stuff's lighting up and happening, right? Again, totally sober when this is happening. But this lets young people know it's not just when you're drunk that alcohol can have those effects. Your still forming brain is very much affected by that alcohol. And the industry is, is chasing after you. Here's some things that are available on Amazon. I don't show these to young people. This is only for the parent presentation. Um, but you can buy these silicone covers that look like Dr. Pepper, Coca-Cola, Pepsi that you can slip over beer cans. Um, there's something called the smuggle mug, which looks like an umbrella, but it's actually a flask. Um, there's also mittens that you can put alcohol into, and then there's a little opening where the thumb is, so you can have the alcohol in and then drink. Um, feminine hygiene products, because we know especially um, if a male is searching the bag, they're not going to want to dive into those, right? So they're making it easy. I'm going to quickly go over some marijuana. The biggest thing, if uh, marijuana is a subject that's kind of new to you, the biggest thing I'd really like to get through to you today is the marijuana today is completely different than the marijuana of even 10 or 15 years ago. What I'm talking about is the THC level. The THC is the part of marijuana that gets you high. CBD is the other main part. There's no high resulting from CBD. The THC in marijuana back in the 60s and 70s was like 1% to 3%. Today, just in the dry form, it's anywhere from 15 to about, it's even up to like 35% now. And if they're vaping it, which means in liquid form, you can get up to 100% THC. So the facts are, we really don't know. Science doesn't quite know yet what 90, 80% THC, what effect that's going to have on a still developing brain. Um, I can't think that it's good. 
Um, a really good uh, resource is, is something called Smart Approaches to Marijuana. I, I suggest you look them up. Kevin Sabat is, is kind of their leader and um, they have some really good facts about marijuana. This is what they came up to. If you combine the higher potency with the more, the people not only are people using marijuana, but they're using it more frequently. He said back in the day, it would be like the caffeine in 120 ounce Coke compared to 33 16 ounce cappuccinos. So compare the caffeine in those two things. Somebody that smoked pot, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, that's what they were getting. And then now this is what they're getting. It's such a huge difference. I can't relay that enough. Um, uh, vaping is a big part. So I, we talked about vaping a little bit. You can vape anything that you can vape, vape tobacco in, you can vape marijuana in. Um, as some of us know about 420, you know, that was kind of the moniker to identify if you were a pot smoker, they say 420. Now 710 is the new one. If you see 710 and it's, if you flip it upside down, it spells oil. So this is kind of the way that they're advertising that they're smoking that high potent, potent vape kind of marijuana. There's about 2000 videos on YouTube right now that show you how to turn dry plant marijuana into liquid marijuana that you can vape, this harder stuff. And man, they make it so easy. They even have these wonderful flavors that you can then mix with your liquid form of THC. And so it smells and tastes like lemon or mango. And since those don't have anything negative in it, anybody can buy them. Um, and what you're looking at here, it's about $100 for 100 of those little things that go into vape pens. So once you make your liquid marijuana, man, they're making it really easy. Everything you see here is a marijuana product. Now tell me, is this, is this made to attract a 30-year-old consumer or a 15-year-old consumer, right? I don't want to be, you know, negative Nancy here, but I'm thinking it's going for the young kids. Um, anything from soda. Um, over here on the right, this, this one concerns me probably the most. Just like you have your little packets of crystal light, you know, that you can pour into your bottle of water. These are little packets of THC. Um, and you can pour those into water. They are odorless and they are colorless. So a kid can have that in his water and you would not know. Um, again, using in secret is getting easier and easier. One of the big things I like to make sure and tell young people too, that marijuana is especially bad for anxiety. And here's why. What you're looking at here is a natural brain chemical on the left in the green called anandamide. That's something that our brain naturally produces because we need that to chill us out when we're kind of freaking out. Well, check out on the right. That's what THC looks like to our brain. What do you notice? Look at the little bottom part because that's the part that go into the brain receptors. They look the same, right? So when we use all those high product THC, our brain thinks, whoa, I got way too much anandamide. I got to quit making anandamide. So that when you're in class or something you know, anxious happens, you don't have that production, that natural production of anandamide that somebody who doesn't use marijuana might have. So even though marijuana kind of gives you that initial chill out, calm down, in the long run, somebody that uses marijuana, especially the more often they use it, they're gonna be higher anxiety. Um, another thing too, and I'm gonna breeze through the, these next couple here. Um, we're really finding more and more, and I've heard a lot of parents speak about losing their children to psychotic breaks due to only marijuana. And this is an interesting study. I, I really encourage you to check out Johnny's Ambassadors. That's kind of their main thing is, is doing research and you know making research like that known. Um, but there's an interesting study out that basically says, out of all the drugs that cause kind of temporary psychotic symptoms, cannabis has the highest conversion rate from just a temporary momentary to a permanent, like schizophrenia or bipolar. Um, marijuana by far, more than opioids, hallucinogens, amphetamines, marijuana is the most dangerous, especially to young brains. Um, Scrominy, I don't have a lot of time to talk about that, but basically it's called cannabinoid hypermesis syndrome. It's when somebody overdoses on marijuana and they are throwing up violently and having extreme, extreme stomach pains. 
Um, some kids have actually died from this because when they go into the emergency room, not all doctors know about this and understand that it's, it's actually marijuana toxicity that they're suffering from. So if you know somebody that uses marijuana and has this, it's important to kind of bring that up, especially to their doctor. Here's something else just to freak you out a little bit. <laughs> but here's all the products out there that make it really easy to use in secret. Um, we actually have a separate pre presentation for adults called Hidden in Plain Sight, where I can actually show all of the different products. One of the ones I want to highlight here is this young lady in the middle. She's wearing a vape. Uh, you can't tell, but if you look at her little strings here and inside the pocket, you can't see it. You plug the vape in there and then you just pick up the little string and you take a puff. So she is actually wearing a vape. Notice they don't put vape wear like they do Adidas or Nike, right? It's, it's kind of all undercover. Um, but I really do believe this industry is hunting our children. I really do believe it. They're looking for the next addicts. Um, breaking news, like these just came out. I know that Robert talked about vaping. Please make sure your young people understand that tobacco-free vaping is not safer than other kind of vaping. Studies are showing that young people are thinking, oh, tobacco free, that means it's nicotine free. Absolutely not. It's the nicotine that's dangerous for you. Uh, so you wanna be careful, but they're getting around some of those, a lot of the flavor bans that have been happening. The industry is getting around the flavor bans saying, well, there's no tobacco in here. So it's not technically an e-cigarette, but basically what it is is liquid nicotine that they're flavoring. Man, these guys are clever, right? Uh, one more thing, if you, we talked about TikTok earlier. Um, this, this is kind of scary. This is actually screenshots from a video. I didn't want to show the video because there's music playing in the background that's very inappropriate in terms of lyrics, but I'd be happy to send you the video if you would, don't mind that, want to see it. What this is, is ways that young people can order vapes or drugs through the internet, uh, pay this person, and they wrap it up hide it in the box under what looks like candy so that if it gets delivered and the parent opens it, it just looks like a friend of theirs sent them a little care package. Here's another one that they wrap up, the black gloves kind of freak me out, but they wrap it up, stuff it in some slippers with some sleep masks and send that along. Um, but that's a new way that young people are getting access to these drugs. So I really uh, suggest going online and doing a search. I always say, parents, you need to be monitoring your kids' social media. It's a must. There's paid ones called Bark. There's free ones. Um, if you can do it, and if that's okay with you in terms of privacy, I would suggest it. Um, but talking early and often is important. The communication skills, I won't go too much into those because I know Mario and Robert did a great job with those. This is one of the things, if you leave with nothing else, I hope every parent goes home or right now <laughs> when they're at home and downloads the Talk They Hear You app. It's amazing. You can go on there and there's different situations that you click on, break from homework, when they're heading out for the weekend, you know, when I'm concerned, and it gives you tips on exactly what to say. And there's actually ways that you can practice the conversations beforehand. Um, there's a, a really good youth vaping guide that I wanted to make sure when I send you the, when I send you the PowerPoint, hopefully you can click on that link. Um, My Life, My Quit is a really good app for young people that are wanting to quit, especially vaping. It's designed for addictions specifically, and uh, young people are finding it's a really good way to quit. I also want to turn you on to um, a local thing, One Pill Can Kill Sack.com. It's one like the number one. Um, a lot of people have heard about the fentanyl issues coming up lately, which is pretty scary. There's some really good information on there. I don't have time to get into it, but please check out that website. Um, our RDA here in Sacramento uh, worked with the Sac County SEPTI to create this website. So please check that out. Um, there's also a really good on there, it's like a little link. One pill can kill one spelled out. <laughs> there's one with the number one and one spelled out where you can kind of do a no random pills pledge with your young people. Um, it's a really good uh, organization that does that one. Um, and the peer pressure skills is something that I won't get into too much because Robert again did, did end up talking about that. Um, but I have the real steps on here. If you do want to practice those with young people, this is something that we find if they could practice these resistance skills step by step, it's a really good way for them to practice those peer pressure refusal skills that happen. 
Um, just to let parents know, just like Robert said, <laughs> here's, here's some of the tests that are available out there. If you do think your young person might be using, again, this is a very personal choice. Um, but Amazon, Target, Walmart has all of these. And one more new product I want to show you. Um, this is a new company just literally launched the beginning of October. So I do, we don't know a whole lot about them, but they contacted us because basically what they have are these pins, if you see right here by the belt. And if you take the cap off, you can touch the pin to an, like candy or an edible or something like that. Um, and it'll let you know if there's THC, or if you do it to a pill, it'll let you know if there's fentanyl in there. Um, and they're about, you get, I think about four tests for 20 bucks, I think is what it is. But this is them, verifique.net. Again, they're brand new, so we don't know a whole lot about them. But I do like, because parents do ask me, well, if I find something, how do I know if it's THC or not? This is kind of a way to sort of do that. So please check out some of the resources here. We do have some of those, what to say when, like if a teen says this to you, well, I don't think I can use marijuana because it's natural. What can you say back to that, right? And just some quick fact sheets that you're welcome to hand out to parents or other professionals, anything on there you can download and just reproduce and hand those out, you know, however you see fit. Um, but that's the end. I'm sorry, I know I went over, I'm so sorry. Um, but if you, if you do want any more of these, these type of topics where we do the hidden in plain sight, uh, we are talking a lot about mental health. Teens, as your, uh, teens under stress is another one and really encouraging kids to not, you know, turn to especially marijuana and alcohol for their mental health needs. Um, but here's my email and our outreach coordinator, Chris, can help you as well. And that's it. I'll stop talking. <laughs> if, you guys, if you have any questions, I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen if that's okay. Is that good, Luis, if I stop doing that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. I felt like I talked so fast, but please email me. I can send you every single thing I have and even more if you want it. You might regret asking me for information actually, because I'll feel, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, I'll send you whatever you want. <laughs> thank, thank you, Cherie. You shared lots yeah. of, lots of great information. I know it was a short time to, to cover mm -hmm. all of that, but all of the information you shared was great. And I mm -hmm. learned something new with the hidden products. Um, that was new to me and it's really quite Quite concerning. Um, we hope to have you back maybe in the spring and we can do a deep dive on, on substances. Um, I know great. that's, you know, it's important to empower parents with information about raising awareness for that. So we, we thank you for your time Absolutely. and to everyone tuning in tonight. I hope you have, um, you know, enjoyed the presentations and received all of the valuable information. Uh, we're coming up on the uh, last leg of our night tonight. And uh, to close off the show this evening, we have a special closing session by Molly Ree and Sharon Shepard, who work for uh, Mutual Assistance Network. Uh, their presentation tonight is focused on healthy family communication. And a little bit about mutual assistance. Uh, mutual assistance is a local community-based organization that works to st strengthen the existing social and economic infrastructure of Del Paso Heights, Arden Arcade, and the surrounding Northern Sacramento neighborhoods. Their mission is to advance social and economic opportunities so families can thrive. Uh, tonight's speaker, Smalley, who is a home visitation program manager, and Sharon, who is a neighborhood nav navigator, uh, will be, uh, sharing our closing presentation focused on ways to have healthy family communication about some of the topics discussed tonight, as well as um, just general tips uh, for, for parents and family members and, um, you know, raising students and, and youth. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here so I can um, share their presentation. All right. And then without further ado, I'll turn it over to Molly and Sharon. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Sharon Shepard, and I'm the Neighborhood Navigator for Arcade Community Center and the Firehouse Community Center. And hi, everyone. My name is Molly Ray. I am the Home Visitation Program Manager at Arcade Community Center for Mutual Assistance Network. So, Today, we're going to be, oh yeah, go for it. Uh, Sharon, I know we're going to, I think we skipped to the, the agenda. Um, 
but yeah, we're going to be talking about healthy family communication. Um, here's just our, our brief agenda. Um, and we're going to talk about what healthy communication is, kind of how to create a safe space in your in your family so that you can have conversations about difficult topics like uh, Shari was just talking about, um, strategies, kind of what kind of some perspective on what young adults and teenagers might be going through. And then we have some, um, some more uh, resources at the end. So we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so, oh. Oh no. Let's see. Um, I'm wondering, that didn't work. I have, is the um is it the visual on here is that yeah here? it's a little funky so i'm wondering um maybe if i would you share like my me, screen yeah would you like me to give you access to share yours sure yeah okay um sometimes uh depending on the version of powerpoint got it yeah it may throw off some of the visual yeah. But I just made you a co-host, um, Molly. Okay, let's let's start this over. Let me get my share screen. Is that working? Um, it says it? that you have started screen sharing. Oh, there it goes. There we go. Oh, oh. that's better. Yeah. Thank you, Molly. All right, there we go. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, okay. Sorry about that. So what is healthy family communication? Um, effective family communication creates an environment where family members are comfortable sharing their thoughts and feelings, um, building relationships stronger and equipping them with the tools they need to handle other life situations. Linda Darby. I chose this quote because I felt like it embodied the definition perfectly. I also like the fact that it mentioned the word environment. Now, when I say environment, I don't necessarily mean like the physical environment, like the location, though that is still an important aspect. I'm referring more to the space that you create, the vibe, the energy you give off when you're having these communications or trying to commute, excuse me, communicate with your young person. For example, if you're trying to have a serious conversation with someone and they're constantly laughing or giggling or staring off into the distance, this is going to give you the perception that this person's not listening, right? Or they don't care, or they're constantly like not taking you seriously. These are all negative feelings. And now no one is receiving the message from either person. That space is now just like a negative space. So this is a result of the space that was created. This is why creating a safe space and a positive environment is the foundation for healthy family communication. I'm sorry, can you guys still see me? Yes, I'm, I'm trying to go yeah. to the next slide. Uh, there we go, how do we have, there we go. Okay, so this section is about creating that safe space that we talked about. Creating the safe space begins with you. It's the energy that you give off that creates the space. The first step is to check all your preconceived notions or your judgments at the door. So everything that you think or you feel, oh, you feel your young person isn't doing this right. It's okay to still think that, but kind of just come into the space with an open mind. No one wants to walk into a conversation feeling as if they're gonna be judged. It just causes them to not wanna share their feelings or be honest because of the fear that the other person is gonna react like, oh my gosh, you know, you know, just being judgmental. No one wants to talk with someone who's gonna judge them with everything that they say. So instead, just come into the space with an open mind and be willing to listen. Often we listen to respond instead of listening to understand. And it's completely normal to wanna to respond and give your opinion, but Sometimes it's best just to remain silent and listen because it keeps the space neutral. And in silence without any distractions, people feel heard and respected. So instead of filling the space with your opinions and your judgments, 
Try to fill it with warmth and love and understanding instead. Absolutely. Okay. So let's talk about some healthy communication strategies, kind of the, the do's and don'ts. Um, and Sharon just kind of touched on all of these, but we, we thought a, a list would be really important. Um, active listening. So again, as Sharon mentioned, don't be distracted. Active listening means, you know, you're, you're looking at each other, um, no one has their phones, no one has distractions, the TV is off, right? It's, it's, a, it's, it's that you're showing, you know, through your body language, um, maybe nodding your head or going, yeah, you know, ways that you can show that you're really listening and hearing what someone is saying. Um, it's, communication is hard, so all of these things are, are skills, right? Not, it's really hard, especially as adults, when we haven't learned these skills. Um, to practice them. So practicing communication and good communication skills, I would say, you know, there's a ton of, you know, internet, you can do a deep dive on Google of like healthy communication skills. And I, and I highly recommend everyone doing that and practicing them in the moments where it's not tense, right? Practicing it for just like, you know, let's talk about how your day was over dinner, using I statements, things like that. Um, Valid, I want to talk about the term validating and what it means to validate someone, right? Your kids might come to you with all kinds of questions or thoughts or opinions, right? They're getting so much information from their peers at any given moment, right? They might come to you with something that you like, are just like, how do you even think that? That's not in line with our family values. Like, I can't even imagine. And it might, it might even like, activate some feelings inside of you. Validation does not mean that you agree with everything, but it shows empathy. It shows that you can say, huh, that's an interesting thing. And, and it gets you more in a curious space. So I really, I think validation is, is a really crucial part of healthy communication that we don't talk about enough. And people think that when you validate that you're like, just kind of leaning in or being a pushover. And it's really not, it's saying, it's, it's saying, I hear that. And can I offer a different opinion perhaps? But, but first, people need to feel understood and heard so that they can have a safe space to express themselves. Um, boundaries also really important. Um, boundaries are what you uh, impose, what, like boundaries are not rules, right? Rules, and again, it's okay to have a household with rules, right? Um, and also there are certain boundaries that might just say, hey, if you do this, then these are what the consequences are. And being very clear about it and sticking to those consequences, right? Or if, they, if the mixed messages are coming, then, youth are, are going to say, oh, well, you said this last time, but you didn't do that. So like, I'm going to still stay out past my curfew because there's no repercussions. Um, it's important to, to have very clear boundaries around specific topics. Same with keeping your word, right? Um, being able to explain your reasoning, thoughts, and feelings. And that's really important instead of saying, because I'm the adult, right? Youth are expressing their autonomy and that is healthy, right? We want to have you know, critically thinking adults who can make strong decisions as they grow up. And if you as an adult can talk to them and treat them as, as you know, a young adult um, who might need a little guidance, but not as necessarily more of like a tyranny dictatorship kind of way, it really helps them say, oh, like I do have autonomy and that's really gonna help them later in life. Um, and then of course, paying attention to nonverbal messages, right? Like a lot of what we say, isn't actually coming out of our mouths. It's the, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the, you know, hand movements that we're using or the body language, right? If we're kind of like sitting there and, and our, our eyes are looking down, that's saying that there's, that something is up, even if the kids are saying, I'm fine, right? How many of us, I mean, as a teenager, still I do this to this day, like, we're like I'm fine when I'm not fine, right? Um, and so if you can tap into that and say, hey, you're saying you're fine, but I see you, you know, doing this. And it can get youth also to be, um, more in tune with themselves and be better communicators themselves. Um, and then the don't, again, stated already, try not to be judgmental or try not to express judgment, right? Like we all have, as, as humans, we judge and we, you know, we have our, our thoughts, but try not to be judgmental. And, and again, lean into curiosity. Um, don't be dismissive. Don't say, oh, that's stupid. You don't know you're young. I, you know, that's, that's dumb. That really hurts. And, and especially as a parent or caregiver, kids want to know that you're, that you have their back and that they can talk to you and be understood. Um, and they, they're often seeking for guidance without actually coming out and saying, I want guidance. Um, try to have an open mind, right? That can be hot. Like all of these, I just want to also just disclaimer, these are all very easier said than done, right? 
kids will trigger you. Your own kids will trigger you, right? Like they will have all the feelings coming up in, you know, and so this, again, it takes a lot of, of self-awareness too. Um, don't make assumptions, right? Don't assume, assume that you know what they're thinking, right? Their experience as a youth in 2021 is very different from your experience as a youth in whatever time you were a youth, right? There's, it's just a whole different ball game right now. Um, so yeah, those are some of the do's and don'ts of healthy communication. And these are really healthy communication strategies for anyone, but particularly with youth and especially, you know, a parent-child relationship is, is one of the most tender relationships I think we can have. Youth, um, you know, they probably wouldn't say it this way, but we can see it as kind of like an existential crisis, right? Like they are, you know, their, their brains are growing, they're, they're understanding the world in different ways. They're not, they're not children really anymore. They're not adults. They're in this in-between space. Um, they're, they're really looking for, for community. They're looking for, they, you know, they're starting to, to differentiate, meaning they're starting to kind of like, who am I as a person, right? right. They're questioning their, their meaning, their purpose, their value. They're questioning things that maybe they grew up with and saying, is that really, does that really fit for me? Um, and that can feel, very hurtful even just questioning of things that are very important to you as an adult um or you know you as, as someone who's created this family when when you have values in your youth your children might have different ones than you uh, that's a really really hard thing to come to terms with right um sometimes they're um you know like if if they are kind of in more of a, an existential crisis, or if they're if they're going through something you know really rough, they might um, be self isolating from their usual group of friends. Um, you know, if grades are lower, I think again it's about noticing trends, right? If all of a sudden things change, that's really important. Um, it's really important to notice like something might be up and to, again, create that safe space to talk about it. Um, if they have lower motivation than us usual or disinterest in things that they used to have interest in. Um, and then, you know, extreme emotions, like youth are also known for extreme emotions. And, and I think it's really more if like that seems like it came out of nowhere, right? Um, Again, asking the questions, not making assumptions. Um, and this is kind of things that it could mean, right? Feeling unsure of what their future holds. They may have, it's stressful for youth, right? It, I mean, it, it's like, we don't, I, I don't think we understand how stressful it can be just to like be in a peer support. There's all of this stuff going on on the internet all the time, right? Like there's just a lot of stresses that children hold that I think we can devalue because they were like, you don't work or like, you don't, you know, you don't have to pay the bills or you don't have to, you know, pay as many bills or, you know, all of these things. But like, it's also really stressful. And I think having empathy for youth is a really important piece. Um, they may be overwhelmed. And again, not feeling like they have a safe person to turn to. Um, and then maybe there's some other medical help that, that they might be needing, right? Like a great therapist or a coach or some, or mentor. Um, sometimes it might be that they do need medication, right? Um, and, and really being able to, to lean in and say, you know, it's okay if there are things that are going on for you because your experience um, is, you know, I value your experience and I want you to feel safe sharing that with me. So kids, you know, youth are in a very specific developmental phase, right? Um, their prefrontal cortex is not fully developed. I know that the previous presentation was talking about like their risk. Lots of times youth are risk takers, right? Because they haven't developed all the full critical thinking skills. Um, they are going to test the boundaries of what they can and can't say or do. And understanding this from like a developmental perspective that like they're doing that to like, you know, to learn. They might not realize that and they, they can't necessarily verbalize that, but they're they're testing boundaries. And that's super important to, to, you know, their development and to them growing into adults who are, you know, successful in the world. Um, let's be honest, teens can be real mean, right? Like they will say hurtful things to you. They, know, you know, you know them, but they also know you really well. They don't necessarily think about things and the consequences of what they say, Oop, excuse me, or the heaviness of their words. Oh no, there we go, sorry about that. Um, and so, 
you know, I think again, being able to have moments of vulnerability where you can say, Hey, you know, that really hurt. That really hurt my feelings. When you said this thing, it can get them kind of like thinking about their act or thinking more about their actions and getting them to think before they speak, um, instead of just lashing out and, and in anger. Um, again, it's hard to be vulnerable, especially with kids as they're going to like be <laughs> potentially like bringing up a lot of stuff for you. Um, they really want their opinions to be heard, right? They really want to, they really want to be adult. And we know that they're not fully there, but they're not, they're not, not fully, you know, like they're, they're in this, they're in this in-between space. And so treating them as much like, like adults, um, is it's a balancing act, but, um, they do want to be heard and they want to be, they don't want to be treated like kids. Um, and here's just kind of a, a tough pill to swallow sometimes is often they're communicating the way that they were taught, right? And you're the biggest example. And so sometimes when, once we get to teenagehood, right, there have been some, some family dynamics and some stuff that's been built up over, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, if it's really a struggle, then I think there are also things for families. There's family therapy, right? Um, and, and I think there's like lots of ways to, to try to break those cycles and dynamics if they're becoming really harmful. Oh, you're on mute, Sharon. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so parents need help too, right? Um, when approaching your child, try and be in a positive, warm, and open mental space. Creating a safe space isn't solely for your child. It's also for you, you know, for yourself as a parent. Parenting is hard work. So just come into it, afraid to take a break from the conversation if it's starting to feel overwhelming or you're just feeling yourself just being really negative. That's completely normal. Parenting is an emotional roller coaster. So avoid feeling guilty. Notice the positives and you know, have a resource, a um, parent group, close friend, therapist, or a friend to reach out you know, when you need. There's also gonna be a list of resources that provide parents with support at the end of the presentation. Or next, actually. Okay. So resources for, um, yeah, some resources for parents are the Child Abuse Prevention Council, Placer County, Child and Family Institute, Kaiser, La Familia Counseling Center, um, the National, um, what was the other one? There's a good one. Um, that's like a Facebook group. There are plenty of Facebook groups that um, deal with family supports for teens, young children, different groups to get together in. There's a support education and adv advocacy for mothers and fathers of children with special needs. And, and we also at Mutual Assistance Network um, have parenting classes for ch children of all ages, just to brush up on your parenting skills, learn some new ones. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and we also have, you know, resources for teens because oftentimes teens need a space where they can, you know, go to talk to someone. Um, so here's, here's a bunch. There's, you know, you can always make a referral through Sacramento County Access and we can support with that at Mutual Assistance Network. Um, and then there's, there's oftentimes different organizations that support youth, you know, going through different things. I know like there's Gender Health Center and LGBT Center for like, if you're, you know, if your child is, um, has come out to you as, as, you know, gay or lesbian, bisexual or queer or transgender, um, that can be something that can be really hard as a parent, um, but it's, it's really important to honor the experience of your child. And um, I know one of the resources is, is like PFLAG, which is the parents and families of lesbian and gays, but it's really for more um, LGBTQ community. Um, and so, you know, I know that's, that's a big thing that come up, comes up. Um, it, it will never, it's never a good idea to have uh, some kind of like, um, 
ab there's been a lot of research that shows that abstinence only education and rules will absolutely like cause children to go the other way right and so again creating the safe space where like if your youth are talking to you about things um you know you're 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 not just saying nope you can't do that that's not okay um that can cause a lot of really damaging um psychological stuff for kids right um and um you know we absolutely like respect everyone's family values and things and also there are certain things that you know youth who are not supported in 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 parts of their identity um can have a lot of really negative health outcomes uh later in life so just want to put a plug for really really listening and and being open to um all kinds of diversity in youth. Here's some crisis resources and some drop-in centers in um, in Sacramento. Um, there's also Wind Youth Services. Yep, right there. There's they have a crisis hotline, um, California Youth Youth Crisis Hotline. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of all kinds of resources out there, and this PowerPoint will also be sent to you all. Um, and Mutual Assistance Network actually has a youth program, um, Healing the Hood. Um, the goal is to decrease community violence through comprehensive violence prevention, intervention, and interruption services. Um, they have resources for youth as well as on the ground crisis response. Um, we have youth and family case management, mentoring and youth development programs, as well as job training and academic enrichment services. And at the end of the presentation, all the information to contact Mutual Assistance Network will be on there. Yeah. Thank you all so much. These are our two community centers. The Firehouse Community Center is in Del Paso Heights. The Arcade Community Center is right here on Marconi. Um, and we have a couple other community centers that we operate in, in Del Paso. Um, but call us if you have any questions um, and we'd love to get you connected to, to any kind of services. Awesome. Thank you so much, Molly and Sharon. Uh, thank you for closing out the show with lots of great information and lots of great tips for families to, to have um, conversations with their youth and, and strategies on how to have healthy relationships. Um, Mutual Assistance Network is a great organization and they do many great things to support community members, families, and students in our community. So I encourage everyone to check out their services and their website. And Molly, Sharon, thank you so much for your time and always supporting our work. Um, I know uh, we're a little bit over our scheduled time. Uh, we're just about wrapped up with tonight's workshop, but we want to close out on a fun, positive note. I hope that all the information shared, which I know was a lot, has been really helpful to all of our parents, guardians, family members, and community members tuning in tonight. Um, and we hope to have more of these presentations in the future. Um, we thank you for, you know, taking time and investing in, in learning and empowering yourself about these important topics. And um, I'm going to hand it over to Virginia, who is go going to lead us in our closing raffles. Um, Virginia, go ahead, take it away. All right, guys, welcome back. Definitely had some more um, people sign up for the raffle, so I'm going to share my screen. And then one by one, we will share what you will win. Awesome. So, and uh, Virginia, we have how many um, prizes for our grand finale? We have three prizes. So get excited. Because All right. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so okay. what's, what's our first prize? First up, we got two Habit Grill tickets and a backpack full of some sweet, sweet, school supplies so i am about to press the button and good luck awesome all right abdul yes Woo. all right congratulations abdul that's awesome all righty into the next one four tickets so a family pack to golf land so it's four tickets for mini golf super fun it's one of my favorite pastimes every time i travel i go to a new golf course so just so you know a little bit more more about me and here we go
Oh my God, that was so close. Like, that was crazy. So Neelam. All right, Neelam, awesome, congratulations. All right, and grand prize. Thank um, you, thank you very much. All right, so our grand finale, our grand prize of the evening is a family game night pack um, with a tote from the Family Community Engagement Office team. And this family game night pack, um, uh, pack is filled with some uh, board games and family activities, and also includes some certificates for Leatherby's uh, Family Creamery, um, as well as some base swag items in there. Um, so we'll end the night on that note and go, go for it, Virginia. Rosa, Rosa, family game night pack. Congratulations. All right. Congratulations, Rosa. So to all our winners, uh, we have your information from your raffle ticket. So we'll be in contact with you to get you your fun prices. Um, so on that note, um, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, we are all out of time today. Um, we do ask if you have just a couple minutes to complete an exit survey for us. Um, this survey will be an opportunity to share feedback and let us know what you enjoyed about the workshop, what you wanna learn more about, and it helps us plan for future sessions. So I'm gonna put the, the link in the chat. And um, we also have the QR code um, where you can scan with your mobile device. Um, so if you have a couple minutes um, to fill that out, we would greatly appreciate it. I'm just going to leave this on the screen for a couple minutes. And thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Thank you for our guest speakers. Uh, we, we appreciate your partnership and your support. And to the Preventions team, all of our FACE team, everyone that helped put this together, thank you. And um, families, I hope you have a wonderful holiday season. And uh, thank you again for being active and, and um, being a part of your students' education.